Hi guys, my name is Jenny Hensel. I'm at the Quincy Mall today, and we're gonna go around and find out what gratitude means to people. So let's go ask some people what they're grateful for. What is something that you're grateful for? Our military. My number one is probably family. Family and uh, my Lord and Savior, actually. Oh, that, I love, that's my favorite answer for today. Yes. So I'm really grateful for the fact that right now I can live my dream, and that is owning my business here. What does gratitude mean to you? Just being thankful for all the blessings that are in our lives and remembering actually how blessed all of us are, even in good times and in bad times. I think it just means seeing the positive in everything. Gratitude is just being so thankful for what you have that you want to just kind of pass it on to other people um, and uh, make them happy as well. You know, kind of share that feeling of positivity. Well, good morning, Crossing Church. How are you doing today? You doing all right? Yeah, yeah. You sound like the first service. I got a little too much tryptophan in them. You know, they're, yeah, yeah. You're still getting over it, right? You're still getting over the, the carb explosion that happened at your house. How many of you did all of the, all the traditional stuff? Did you do all that? Did you do the mashed potatoes and gravy? Did you do the homemade noodles? Did you do the stuffing inside, outside the bird? How many of you had a fried turkey? How many of you had a baked turkey? How many of you had a smoked turkey? Yeah, I don't know what other kinds there are. Anyway, yeah, so we're all dealing with that. We're all kind of getting over it. Uh, you've had the family in, you've had the family out. Some of you are going, <sighs> right? Yeah, you kind of have that little sigh of relief. And that's just kind of the nature of Thanksgiving. It's, it's got its highs, it's got its lows, it's got everything in between. Lots of memories, right? Just thick with, with all sorts of incredible memories that we create. I want to welcome all of our campuses that are joining with us across the region. If you're inside online or .tv, so thankful for each and every one of you. And I remember one of these Thanksgiving seasons a number of years ago, back when we were only uh, at one location, just 48th Street at the time, we had a guy uh, working here that we'd actually imported from South Africa named Barry Stander. And uh, he was an incredible children's minister. And I remember we got in this season, and so, you know, he's look, got this kind of confused look on his face, and we're going through that. And, and I'm asking him, like, well, what do you uh, have for Thanksgiving in South Africa? And he looked at me, and he goes, we don't have Thanksgiving in South Africa. It never really occurred to me that, you know, Thanksgiving, when we think about it, is really kind of an American holiday. There really isn't a South African version uh, of that. And so I thought, what a sad thing. How absolutely, you know, just depressing that is to think of a year without Thanksgiving. It's such an important part of our year. Is it just an American tradition? Is it just pilgrims and Native Americans and learning how to plant corn and, you know, all that kind of stuff? Uh, or are there other nations that actually set time aside to celebrate the harvest? I did a little research on it found out that we're not the only country that celebrates Thanksgiving. In Germany, on the 1st of October, they celebrate something called Erntedankfest. Don't need to repeat that. But it's a harvest festival that actually precedes Oktoberfest. You know, by the time you get to the end of October and you're German, you really don't know what's going on anymore, right? <laughs> we know that, those of us that live in these German communities. Anyway, anyway uh, there actually is a German uh, Thanksgiving. In Japan, there's Kinro Kansha Ho uh, No Hai. I didn't say that right at all. On November 23rd. In Canada, there's a harvest festival that's celebrated on November the 6th. There is actually a form of Thanksgiving celebrated in Grenada, in Liberia, in the Netherlands, in China, in Korea, or even in Vietnam. I think about Korean food and Vietnam food for... Uh, uh, for Thanksgiving, it would be so completely foreign uh, to what anything, I, it would be interesting to see, well, what do they eat for their harvest meal or their Thanksgiving meal? Well, when we think of Thanksgiving, there's all of these memories and thoughts and traditions that come up, right? But Thanksgiving is really more, way more than just a holiday. Actually, Thanksgiving is a state of mind and it's a state of mind that God wants us to have every day. 
every single day of the year. A, a, a few uh, sermon series back, we were in the book of Psalms. And uh, we got into the later Psalms, and there's a Psalm that says, it's good to praise the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. And I've, I've tried to keep a discipline since that uh, sermon series to every morning, when I pray in the morning, I pray that part of the prayer. Like I recognize that uh, I'm going to proclaim the love that Jesus has, that God has for me in the morning. No matter what's going to happen in my day, one thing I know is that God loves me, that Jesus loves me. And I'm going to remember that throughout the day. And then it says, and your faithfulness at night. When I get to the end of a day, I want to be able to say, God, today you have been faithful. Maybe I wasn't. Maybe I goofed up, but that doesn't have any impact on your faithfulness. And just to remember his love in the morning and his faithfulness at night helps me to be more thankful. And it's important to be thankful. How many of you believe it's important to be thankful? And not just at one time of the year, but all the times of the year. My parents invested a lot in helping me to learn what it means to be thankful. As a matter of fact, they taught me magical incantations. I know that sounds like because they've been doing like a Harry Potter marathon, you know, like, so what are your magical intent? Really? Your parents were like, you know, some type of occult practice? No, no, but they taught me magical incantations because at almost every turn, they would ask me to repeat the magic words. So if I was at uh, the table on Thanksgiving and I had uh, mashed potatoes on my plate, but no gravy, and the gravy was on the other side of the table, I would say, pass the gravy. And my parents would say, what are the magic words? Right? And if I would repeat the magic words, the most amazing things would happen. Magically, the bowl of gravy would find its way over to my side of the table where I could just baptize my mashed potatoes in gravy. Do you know what the magic words are? Can you repeat them? Please, Please and Please. that's right. They are magical words. Please and thank you. Now, that's an awesome thing to see that when you utilize those words, I think these amazing things like happen to you when you're a kid, right? But well, for, for me growing up, even though those words were important. They really satisfied selfish desires in me. Usually it was because I wanted something and I would ask my parents for it and they would ask me to say that. So it was a selfish motivation. But as I've gotten older, I've learned to be thankful for many things and to speak it out without really expecting something in return. But it does return. If you're a thankful person, it returns exponentially what you invest in it. Having a thankful heart will have a huge impact on your attitude. It'll have a huge impact on your relationships with other people. It'll have a huge impact on your health and on your happiness. And it's been clinically proven, all right? So this isn't just me spouting off a lot of positive words. This is absolute fact. It's been tested and proven clinically that thankfulness will reduce your depression. It will elevate your happiness. It will strengthen your resilience. It will improve your sleep. It will raise self-esteem. It'll reduce pain. It will lower your blood pressure. It'll strengthen your immune system. It will lower your stress. It'll activate physical healing and it will extend your life. It'll make people like you. It will strengthen the compassion inside of you. It'll improve your relationships. It'll create a positive feedback loop where people will give you positive words. It'll help you to achieve your goals. It'll improve your decision making. It'll make you more creative, more productive, a better leader, more humble, uh, less self-centered, more giving, less materialistic, more optimistic about your future. If you could have one of those little amber bottles with a bunch of pills that would do that, you'd buy it. As a matter of fact, you're going to all the health food and GNC to try to find, you know, what's the latest thing I can stick in my mouth and swallow to do that. You don't need to do that. You just need to be thankful. I need to be thankful. Thankfulness does that. 
This is something that you need to say, hey, I need that. I, it'll do all that. Yeah, it will. It will do all that. Well, if we want to find that in God's word, we don't have to look any further than the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was great at the whole concept of thankfulness. And that's good because he wrote or was responsible for the writing of most of the New Testament. The New Testament is comprised of the biographies of Jesus, but it also has these letters that were written, right? And there are letters to seven specific churches that the Apostle Paul wrote to. A couple of them he wrote to multiple times, right? And even though he didn't write the book of Luke and the book of Acts, Luke was his disciple. So he was the one who commissioned the writing of Luke and Acts. And you know what we find out about Paul? He was a very very thankful person. I'll tell you how thankful he was. When we read the story of the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey, when he is locked up after being beaten in a Philippian prison, and we do a backstory on that, what you'll find is that he never had to go to prison. He never had to endure that beating. All he needed to say in front of the town officials was that he was a Roman citizen and demanded due process, and they would have had to give it to him. But he endured that beating and he was put in that prison and put, had his feet put in stocks because he wasn't going to leave his Christian brother Silas who wouldn't be able to claim Roman citizenship and he didn't want him to have to face that alone. Wow, what a heart. Not only that, but while he's down in that prison, while he's, while he's locked up like that, at midnight he starts singing hymns of thankfulness. And Silas starts singing with him. And the whole, uh, all the occupants of the jail are quiet because they're listening to Paul and Silas sing. And it has such an impact on them. When God opens all the doors of the prison cells, nobody leaves. Everybody stays. And the Philippian jailer who wants to kill himself because he, he's going to lose all of his prisoners ends up accepting Jesus and being baptized with his family that night. And then they all go back to the jail and get locked up again. It's an amazing story. And it's all born out of thankfulness. The Apostle Paul was a very thankful person. He was shipwrecked and he was in the open sea a day and a night. That's just, that's just incredible. And even in an environment like that, he was thankful. I was talking to Sonny this week and he was talking about different ministries and how they're asking for money so they can have stuff. You know, I need a new projector. I need this, I need that. You know, and we're like dealing with how we spend money. And, and, and uh, Sonny's come up with this like answer. Anytime people ask him for something, he just says, hey, Paul spent a day and a night in the open sea. Well, I really, need, I really need this projector. Well, Paul spent a day and a night in the open sea. Well, I really need to do this printing thing so I can have uh, like this invitation card. Well, uh, Paul spent a day and a night in the open sea. Really, you may not get everything you want, but listen, you can be thankful in spite of that for all the things that you do have. And we need to learn to have an attitude of gratitude. That's what we see in Paul, and that's what I feel like we need, especially as here we are on the first day of the week into a season of the year where we can really express that gratitude. The Apostle Paul wrote to seven churches and in six of those seven churches, the letters he wrote to them, he actually started the letter with thanksgiving. And here's what I want to do. I want to capture the specific things that he mentions in all those letters of what he's thankful for. And I want to bring all that forward to us. Because just like all those churches in the New Testament, we're a church that God operates through and ministers to. First one is in the book of Romans. So Paul's writing the Roman church in the first chapter, in the eighth verse, this is what he says. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Why? Because your faith is being reported all over the world. What a statement. To know that this itinerant preacher who does all these missionary journeys, who's been all over the world, is telling the Romans that they have a reputation. They have set such a powerful example that their faith and the example of their faith is being reported all over the world. And that's what he's 
thankful for. It's so powerful that everybody is talking about it. There is incredible power in, in an example, isn't there? There's power in an example for the good, and there can be incredible destructive force in the lack of a good example. Those of you that are listening to the news, you might be a little preoccupied with British royalty, have been hearing a lot about Prince Andrew and his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein and some of the things that uh, he's alleged to have done, right? And what's that done? What has that done to the royal family? It sent the royal family into a spin. As a matter of fact, all of his responsibilities, he's been sidelined from all of that. He's been ostracized from his family. And what does that teach us? It teaches us the power of a bad example. When you set a bad example, it has consequences. It has ramifications. But there's also incredible power to a good example. You think of Mother Teresa. I bet most of us can't even like visualize what her voice would even sound like. You may have never even heard her speak or seen a YouTube video of her speaking or anything like that. You, you, you may not think about her as some dynamic, powerful theologian or public speaker, but the power of Mother Teresa is in one thing. It's in her example. So an example can have incredibly powerful implications. And the Romans had a great example. And what the apostle Paul was doing was highlighting that. You, you have an example the whole world is talking about. You know what? There are many of you at the crossing at all of our locations right now. And that's exactly what you have. You have an incredible example and people are looking to you. The example of your life and how that impacts the people around you, they're seeing you as an example and whether you know it or not, they're trying to imitate that example. It may be happening in your marriage. It may be happening with your kids, just in your family or your grandkids. It may be happening around your coworkers. But I guarantee you there are people at the crossing today who have turned their lives over to Jesus Christ and made an incredible uh, dent in the world for, for Christ. And it's been because of the witness of somebody else's example to them that they saw the realness of Jesus Christ and they saw that illustrated in an example. And for those of you that are living out that life and you're doing that great example, I just want to thank you. Like the Apostle Paul, thank you for living out that example because examples are hard. And every day you've got to, you know, suit up and do it again and do it again. And it's hard to live a life consistently like that. And I thank you for the example that you're setting. The second church that he writes to is the Corinthian church, the church in Corinth in Greece. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, he says, always, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. I love, this is a compliment sandwich, okay? Because if you've done much study in the New Testament, you'll realize that the Corinthian church was the most messed up, goofiest church of all the New Testament. It was, a, I mean, they were doing everything wrong. They were doing things so badly, that's why the Apostle Paul had to write 2 Corinthians. Because they basically read his 1 Corinthian letter and they went, I don't know, if I don't care, I don't care about that. Because they were doing so many things wrong. But he still thanked them. Do you know why? Because of the grace that they had received through Jesus Christ. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. It means that you didn't deserve it, but you got it anyway. That's why it's kind of a compliment sandwich. It's kind of a funny tongue-in-cheek thankfulness. Because he's saying, you know what? There are all these gaps in your life, all these ways that you uh, illustrate hypocrisy and an inability to just uh, to, to be consistent in your life. But you know what? In all of those ways, in all those times where you fall short, God lifts you up. God fills up the gaps. He does incredible stuff in your life in spite of you. If the Apostle Paul was from the Southern United States, the way he would have said this is like this. Corinthians, bless your heart. He would have just said, bless your heart. And you know what? When a, when a person in the South looks at somebody else and says, bless your heart, do you know what they're actually saying? You're just so dumb. 
You, you, you just don't get it, do you? But they don't say it that way. They say it in a positive way. My mother taught me, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. And if you're going to say something, make it sound like it's good. And that's a Southern thing. Bless your heart. And I hear Paul say into the Corinthian church, bless your heart. And some of us need to hear that today. We need to hear bless your heart. Not because it's a compliment sandwich, not because there's a put down, but the, the fact is God has changed, uh, changed you. And even though we have gaps and even though we goof up and like some people say, God loves his dumb children, Right. It can be seen in your life and it can be, you can be thankful for that. I listen, listen to me. I've been here almost 22 years and I got to tell you, we've made so many mistakes. We may have done some good things at the crossing, but that list is nowhere near as long as the list of all the goof ups. And I think that God has spent a lot of his time at the crossing, looking over this church, just going, bless their hearts, <laughs> bless their hearts. And he still makes all the difference and lives get changed and families get rearranged and futures get redetermined for eternity in positive, in positive ways. And you know what that does? It gives us a humble opportunity to show what only Jesus can do in a life. And there may be some of you right now that are struggling with the consistency in your life and you're like, I don't even know why God would waste his time on me. It's because when we're weak, he is strong. And he shows up in our failures and does incredible things. Third church and the fourth church that we're going to talk about, he actually said the same thing too. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, this is what he says. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And then in Colossians chapter one, verses three and four, he says, we always thank God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. Now, the phrase that really captures me here is all the saints, because the, the uh, Ephesian church and the Colossians church was, they were committed to the larger church. They were committed beyond just the church in Ephesus. They were committed beyond just a church in Colossae. They had a commitment that extended out, it was very similar to the Apostle Paul's. They had a missionary heart. And that's why these same words are used for both of these churches, because they had a love for all of God's people. I love this because they were able to see beyond their own needs to the needs of others who were outside of their proximity. You know, sometimes, even when we love others, there's a selfishness to it because we want to love those people that we are in proximity to, and we want to neglect people that we are not in proximity to. But that's not the truth about the crossing. And it's not true about the crossing because there's enough of us that are committed to the idea of reaching more people for Jesus Christ that we tend to be a bit like the Ephesian and the Colossian church. So there are people at Monmouth right now that are being baptized in a cattle tank because somebody thought we needed to love people outside our proximity. And there are people that are being baptized in a new baptistry in Jacksonville because we are committed to love people outside of our proximity. As a matter of fact, almost 70% of the people who attend a crossing location attend that location because there's a love for people outside of our proximity. That is really powerful. I think maybe you noticed in the first part of the, of the of worship today at all of our locations, we showed all these baptisms, which is so exciting. But then we got to the, the inside baptisms and it recorded 24 last month, 24 baptisms, right? And, it, and what's so cool about that is that we're talking about a location that's behind walls, that's behind wire, that's behind bars, that's behind locks, that's behind guards, and none of that, none of that 
stops the power of the gospel getting into the hearts and minds of people and changing their lives for all eternity. And it's so exciting to see that happen. We have people right now from the crossing that are in Poland serving the Lord with other believers right now. And we have people that just came back from a trip in Uganda where they were serving the Lord. You know why? Because we know how to love people outside of our proximity. And for those of you that are committed to that in your heart, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you that God is using you as part of the body of Christ to accomplish that great and marvelous thing. The Apostle Paul writes to the Philippian church, chapter one, verses three to six. He says, I thank my God Every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The word that jumps off the page to me here is partnership. Your partnership. You know, there's an equality in partnership in that word, isn't there? There's a feeling of equality. Now, let me, let me just kind of pull a little bit more out of that. How many of you heard this term before? Misery loves company. Have you heard that? How many of you heard this term? Joy loves company. I've never heard that. Why is it why is it that we all know about misery, love, and company, but joy? We don't ever hear that. Well, it's true, isn't it? It's true that as much as misery might love company, I think joy loves company even more. I really do. It's great to have partners. It's great to have people who can not only cry with you, but also rejoice and laugh and be happy with you, right? And in the church, in ministry, these are the early adopters, the promoters, the givers, the people who are committed, not just the consumers. And God has blessed us with people who are partners in the gospel. They exponentially increase the joy of doing ministry because they remind you that you're not alone. And that's what kills you in ministry is a feeling of isolation, that you're doing it by yourself, that nobody notices and nobody cares. But when people partner with you, you realize just how important that is. You know, we sing the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. We sing, though none go with me, still I will follow. And even though we might sing those words, we pray that it will never be true. Because none of us wants to do ministry alone. And I don't want that to be the case. I don't ever want that to be the case. And I'm thankful that I never have to put that to the test when I'm with my family at the crossing. Because there's a partnership in the ministry of the gospel. And I thank you for that. We go to 1 Thessalonians, the first of two letters to Thessalonica, and he says in chapter one, verses two and three, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. And we continually remember before our God and Father the, your work, your work produced by faith, your labor promoted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Your work, your labor, and your endurance. The Thessalonian church was a serving church. That's why I use the, the, those three terms, work and labor and endurance, right? And that's an amazing thing. Service is an amazing thing. They were a church that rolled up their sleeves and got busy. They got to work. And do you know what? Right now, right at this moment, at all of our locations, there are literally hundreds of people who are not involved in the worship time because they are working right now. They're serving right now. They are parking cars. They are greeting people with a smile. They're making coffee. They're changing diapers, dirty diapers. They're cleaning floors. They are teaching children. They're making communion. They're counting the offering. They're running our tech. They're playing instruments. They're hosting small groups. They're organizing trips. They're filling shoe boxes. They're ministering to inmates. They're visiting shut-ins. They're praying and a million other things because we are the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, we serve. 
We serve the body. And for each and every one of you that do that in some way, I just want to say we are so thankful because ministry doesn't happen without the body functioning. Now, you'll notice that there's one church I left out. There's one church that I didn't mention that's in the New Testament. And it is the church in Galatia because the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians. But in the letter to the Galatians, he has no words of thanksgiving. Wow, that kind of stands out. Do you know why? Because the Galatian church, they didn't have an attitude of gratitude. And they replaced the attitude of gratitude with an attitude of criticism, with an attitude of self-righteousness, with an attitude of condemnation. You know, some people actually believe they have the spiritual gift of criticism. Problem is, there is no such thing as a spiritual gift of criticism. There are people that think they actually have the spiritual gift of self-righteousness, but that doesn't exist either, or condemnation. Do you know, it's interesting that we know the scripture, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, which means that if you have a condemning heart, if, if there's condemnation in you, uh, that may mean that you're not in Christ Jesus. Now, I can rem remember some of the words in the book of Galatians, like, you foolish Galatians. Like, he's not saying, I'm thankful for you. Because what they're experiencing in all their false piety are really spiritual handicaps. And we at the crossing, we don't want to be anywhere near that, do we? Instead, we need to be thinking about ways that we can be thankful. How can we be thankful? I mean, I know it's a Thanksgiving weekend and, and, you, and, and you're saying, well, I already did all that, you know? Yeah, you already did all that other stuff. But here's where I want to challenge you on the first day of the week into a whole new season of the year. Ready? You know what you might do? Oh, man. You might get out your phone right now. Some of you already have. Quit playing Candy Crush. <laughs> and you might want to text a thank you to somebody right now. There's somebody that's done something that's emphasized a relationship with the Lord Jesus or encouraged you in some way that you just need to say thank you. And you can do that with a text right now. Or maybe a text is just too short. Maybe you just need to spend a little bit more time. And instead, you need to send an email because you've got a story to tell. And it's going to take a little bit longer and you want them to have a little bit more time to think about it. So you could send an email or check this out. I'm going to blow your mind here. You might actually want to use your phone for what it was intended for and talk to somebody. That's why it's called a, a phone. And you might just say, hey, I just called to tell you that I'm thankful for you for this or whatever, right? Because there's something powerful about actually hearing a person's voice and the inflection in their voice and then to be able to hear their appreciation for your thanksgiving that way. Or you might put off lunch for 15 minutes and literally drive by a person's house today and knock on the door and say, you know, I just couldn't eat lunch before I told you how thankful I am for you. And they actually got to see it on your face. And not just hear it in your voice, not just see it in your text, but, and you know what? They might even invite you in for lunch and their leftovers are awesome this time of year. Could happen, could actually happen, right? You could do that, you could do that right now. Oh man. Or a blown mind. You might look around you at all these locations right now. You might just look around you and go, you know what, we get to this prayer time. I'm walking over to that person 
And I'm going to ask him to come up to the front with me because I want them to hear me thank God for what they did in my life. Wow. What if 7,000 people this weekend did something? How would that contribute to gratitude? How would that contribute to an attitude of gratitude? Because you see, there's something about thank you. I think my mom was right. They really are magic words. We're moving to a time of decision. What up, YouTube family? Hope you guys enjoyed this week's message. I'm gonna encourage you guys to do four things today. One, would you hit that like button and let us know that the content that we're producing is being a benefit to you and to your family? Second thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is hit that subscribe button so that we, we can start to coalesce and go on this journey together. The third thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is hit that bell button. That bell's gonna turn on your notifications so every time we upload content, you'll be notified so you can join in with us as soon as possible. And then the last thing, is if you feel like you've been blessed to be a blessing and you don't give uh, to another church, we would love to give you an opportunity to be generous with us as we try to be generous towards God. You can go to the description below and you can click that link called for the Give app and it will walk you through everything you need to do to make that a reality. We appreciate you, we love you, and God bless you.